رحب بكم بهذا الحلقة من سلسلة الندوات اللي تعقدها المجموعة المستقلة للأبحاث بمختلف الشؤون وإحنا اليوم راح نستكمل ما بدأنا سابقا حول الحوار الاستراتيجي بين الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والعراق و لدينا حلقة ثالثة أيضا الجمعة القادمة إن شاء الله بالتعاون مع معهد واشنطن أيضا هناك ندوة مهمة عن هذا الحوار الاستراتيجي عندنا أيضا يعني رح نحاول بالأيام المقبلة رح نعلمكم رح نستضيف مجموعة أيضا من علماء الاجتماع والسياسة الأمريكان لتسليط الضوء على الحراك الاجتماعي الحاصل في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية الآن اليوم مثل ما قلت رح تكون هو الحلقة الثانية لتناقش موضوع الحوار الاستراتيجي الحوار الاستراتيجي في بين الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والعراق يأتي في ظرف الآن حرج مع بداية تولي السيد الكاظمي للمسؤولية وهناك كثير من المتغيرات السياسية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية الحاصلة واللي تزيد من أهمية هذا الحوار في الحلقة الأولى إحنا ما كانت واضحة عندنا الأمور الآن بدأت تتضح الأمور وبدأت حتى تضحت أسماء الوفود المفاوضة سواء من الجانب الامريكي ومن الجانب العراقي هي لن تكون على مستوى الوزراء راح تكون اجتماع مبدئيا اجتماع يوم واحد هو يوم 11 بالشهر الخميس القادم المفروض على مستوى يعني وكلاء وزراء خارجيه والخبراء وراح يحاولون يفعلون اللجان المشتركه اللي هي مشكلة أساسا ومثل ما فهمنا كانت عقدة بعض الاجتماعات سابقا بالسنين السابقة بس بآخر سنتين توقفت استنادا إلى اتفاقية الإطار الاستراتيجي السابقة الآن راح تكون هناك جولة جديدة من التفاوض أو من الحوار ما أعرف شنو راح ينتج من عدها هذا ما راح نحاول نستجلي مع ضيوفنا اليوم وفي الجمعة المقبلة ضيوفنا اليوم يمثلون وجهات نظر مختلفة داخل واشنطن داخل اثنين من أهم مراكز الأبحاث في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والمؤثرة في القرار راح يكون بالابتداء ويانا الدكتور ستيف كوك الدكتور الأستاذ ستيف كوك هو باحث أقدم في معهد العفو في مجلس العلاقات الخارجية في واشنطن وهو وهي مؤسسة غير ربحية كبيرة مهمة جدا وهو مسؤول عن الشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا والدكتور ستيف كوك هو يحمل عنده شهادة البكالوريوس والماجستير في العلاقات العامة من جامعة جون هوبكنز وعنده ماجستير ودكتوراه في العلوم السياسية من جامعة بنسلفانيا وسبق أن عمل في مركز بروكينز واشتغل أيضا في معهد واشنطن ستيف يجيد يعني اللغة العربية ولو هو اليوم يفضل يتكلم باللغة الإنجليزية بس يمكن رح يكون المدخل باللغة العربية وأيضا هو يجيد اللغة الفرنسية وطبعا لغة الأم هي اللغة الإنجليزية Thank you Steve for your time and for your participation in this panel. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, with 
your article, which is published in, in the beginning of this year, January, I think. Uh, so you published an article in foreign policy based on your uh, last trip to Iraq and to Baghdad. And uh, as I recall that we had some uh, uh, chat and discussion about this article. So uh, can we start with, uh, from this uh, introduction? Please. Okay, thank you. So first of all, in your article, and uh, by the way, uh, Steve uh, is uh, one of the regular writers in the foreign policy and also in the foreign affairs. Uh, and so in, your, in, that, in that article, you question the assassination of Soleimani by United States and ask uh, a very important question about whether his killing will have uh, a positive consequences on Iraq at one hand and the U.S. ability to influence events in, in Iraq on the other hand. Do you still question uh, the assassination of, uh, of Soleimani? Uh, first, before I start, Unke, thank you very, very much for the kind invitation to participate in this, in this webinar. Uh, and I want to apologize to everybody who is listening in. Uh, I do speak Arabic. I speak Arabic in Arabic. درست عربية في دمشق وفي القاهرة وفي فلسطين بس علوت انجليزي أصلا مني and I do also want to say to whoever is doing the simultaneous translation I want to apologize in advance I, I grew up in New York the New York City area and I speak very quickly so if I go too fast please let me know and I will do my very best to slow down. Now, to answer your question, Munke, um, um, I'm I, better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. Um, um, to, to, to answer I'm your very question. Sorry to cut in, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening today, very sorry. But the, the translations seem to be flipped, Ms. Huda. A lot of people are telling me that some people are hearing Arabic and switched, so. Okay, tamam. That's, uh, sorry, Steve. That's okay, Ren. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, 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 in, the, in the broad abstract, was not opposed necessarily to the uh, killing of Qasem Soleimani, given the damage he's done, not just in Iraq, but throughout the Middle East, and the amount of blood that he has on his hand, not just among Americans, but also Iraqis and Syrians and, and varieties of others. What I questioned was, was there a strategy attached to this killing? And what was the broader strategy with regard to Iraq, where the United States has invested so much over so many years? Uh, and it struck me that the Trump administration, as is its habit, um, determined that killing Qasem Soleimani was a good thing, but only kind of in isolation, with not really thinking through either Iran's next steps or what it wanted to do in Iraq after the death of Qasem Soleimani. I know that there's been some diplomacy on the part of the United States emphasizing the fact that a new Iraqi leadership would, not, would need to be Iraqi nationalist, which was, of course, coded terms for people not to be so deeply intertwined with the Iranians. But again, it didn't seem to me at the time, and it still doesn't seem to me, that there is a broader American, American strategy. And my broader view uh, about Iraq is that, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me offer an anecdote. Munkuk, you mentioned this trip that I took to Iraq in mid-December, um, which took me to places that I had, had never been before after departing Baghdad. Uh, we went to a, a number of different places. And I remember being on the road from Sununi to uh, Bara, way out, uh, and I took a photo of a large billboard that said, Al -Iraq, lil Iraqin, Iraq for the Iraqis. And that sums up 
in general, my view of things after so many years of American effort, and by no means do I believe the United States has been wise, has, it's been, has it been culturally attuned, has it thought strategically um, after the initial invasion and the disaster that struck, I think the United States has been doing a lot of kind of, we would call it in English and apologies to translation, backfilling, trying to figure out what to do in, in Iraq. Um, we've proven over and over again that we don't understand Iraq, uh, that we don't have the political will, the resources or the attention span, even for being there for as long as we've been there to continue to try to shape Iraq's future. And, and in the end, that is shaping Iraq's future is the job of Iraqis. Um, that's not to say that there aren't any particular areas in which Americans uh, cannot be helpful or supportive. And I'm not opposed to a strategic dialogue, of course. I, I know something about them. Having never participated in them, I've, I've seen them. And I know how the American bureaucracy prepares for a strategic dialogue. And, so, uh, uh, excuse me for interruption here because yeah. uh, it looks like in this point, uh, maybe uh, Anthony also uh, has the same uh, idea about US strategy in Iraq. He always keep repeating to me since I first met him on 2010 that there is no a clear strategy, U.S. strategy in, in Iraq, uh, and I will ask him about this later on. But uh, uh, what I can uh, also hear now from you uh, that uh, Iraq needs to, to be tackled in, uh, in a better way, in a clear strategy, but at the same time, in, in that article, you mentioned that Iraq uh, uh, is a state in a terminal collapse. Yeah. And U.S. is isolated in Iraq. This is what you, what you saw there. U.S. is isolated in Iraq. And accordingly, you concluded that Iraq is lost. And it's a time to leave. So right. do you still believe in that, especially after now, Kadumi, and we have a new government? Do you still believe in that? In, in, in the main, absolutely. Um, what, the point that I was getting to was that in, in, in a broad sense, I think the United States can help on specific things like the IMF or security. But in order for the United States to do that and to do that effectively, Iraqis need to fix their own political system. They need to take important steps. Otherwise, uh, it seems to me that the United States is, again, would be wasting resources, whether they're political here in the United States, financial resources, military resources in the field, to just continue to contribute to a system that produces bad outcomes, whether it's corruption, security problems, government dysfunction, uh, de-development, and complicated set of, of economic problems. Yeah, you mentioned the new prime minister, Mustafa al and, and And we've had a conversation about him, and I, I think there is, he is a well-intentioned, uh, by all measures, uh, competent uh, Iraqi nationalist. He seems to be the right person. But what I've been cautioning people in Washington is, before you fall in love with Prime Minister Cosmic, we have fallen in love with six previous prime ministers of varying degrees of talent. <laughs> I like we need to fall in love. <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody, it seems, is going to solve Iraq's problem. Uh, and then we get very disappointed. And, and I think that's, that's my next point. It, it, even if even if he is a, a high quality person, I have every reason to believe that he is, Iraq's prevailing political institutions that drive dysfunction, incompetence and corruption will be very, very hard for him to overcome. Either Iraqi politicians, prevailing politicians have to reform themselves out of power. And, and, and I have to be honest, I don't remember any, 
there must be examples, but none of them come to me immediately of politicians actually reforming themselves out of power. There are great statesmen in the history, but it strikes me that currently in Iraq, there aren't great statesmen. Maybe Mustafa Kazemi will be a great statesman, but it's hard for me to see how people will reform themselves out of power. And if they don't do that, that's a signal to the people who were in the streets in October, November, and December. And, and Munka, you were with me at the Council on Foreign Relations in October. And, and what was happening in October was precisely what you predicted in April when you were with me at the Council on Foreign Relations. And all the smart people on Iraq in Washington who joined us for that meeting said, oh, that you were, you were, you were the, the Iraqi who cried wolf, that the, the sky really wasn't going to fall, that, that, that everything was going to be okay in Iraq. And so if politicians don't do those things to reform themselves out of power, it will be a signal to those protesters that they have to try to do it. Uh, they have to try to do it themselves, which only deepens the instability and the dysfunction in, in Iraq. And it's for these reasons, it's for this kind of stalemate that I see Iraq not collapsed, but not successful, but in this kind of terminal collapse that it's 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 an ongoing it's an ongoing problem so so based on this analysis what would you recommend uh, the negotiators in this dialogue yeah this well, is the, the it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question and, and as I was getting to it a bit earlier the way in which the American foreign policy bureaucracy approaches strategic dialogues, and of course, Tony knows this better, better than me. They show up with huge binders, a representative from every US government agency, from the Defense Department to the US Postal Service, with a long agenda of many things, some of which are important and some of which are just because we're having a strategic dialogue. And it strikes me that really what you need in the case of Iraq is a much more limited agenda. And that agenda is we can help in two specific areas. On the economy, we're not going to, we don't have the money, particularly in the trans and post COVID world, the money to provide direct kind of assistance. But we can use our influence within the International Monetary Fund to help Iraq. The question back to our Iraqi interlocutors is, what are you going to do to make it easier for us to make the case for you at the IMF? And here are the things we think you should do. What is it that you're prepared to do? On the security front, I think it's very important that the United States continue training, the continued counterterrorism mission. But and as much as I hate to say it, and, and I really don't want it to be contingent on anything, and it shouldn't be explicitly contingent, but of course, Iraq's political dysfunction, Iraq's um, system of spoils, uh, Iraq's spectacular corruption is a contributing factor. It is not the causal mechanism, but it is a contributing factor to the uh, appeal of extremism to certain groups within Iraqi society. And that needs to be tackled. That is a huge, huge uh, issue. We want to continue. The United States can't fix those problems. We, we can't fix any other country's problems. If you see what's going on in the streets across the United States now, we have our own very deep-seated and worrying problems. So the fact that we ever thought we could help resolve problems in countries as far away as Iraq, something. But, we have to be able to see that Iraq is moving in that direction, that Prime Minister Khazami and the, and, and the Iraqi political class takes these things seriously. Otherwise, our investment, even if it's much scaled back, is going to sow frustration, cause frustration here in Washington because it's not going to get us uh, to get us anywhere. I think the idea of a US strategic dialogue is as Tony has written a ghost. It's, it's imagining an Iraq that doesn't actually exist. So we must, it, we, 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 that, that Iraq doesn't exist. Let's 
let's deal with the Iraq that there is, but really scale back our agenda for a strategic, uh, for a strategic dialogue. Okay, thank you. And you really made a very good, I mean, you uh, made my uh, job uh, easier. Uh, That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you. Going uh, to Tony because uh, I will uh, ask Tony about these ghosts. Uh, Tony, uh, of course, uh, uh, before uh, asking you a question, I, I need to uh, introduce you to the uh, Iraqi audience, uh, though you, you, this is your second time here. Uh, Anthony Kozman, uh, who will be talking about the Iraqi students, uh, is a student of Kursi Berk for uh, the research in the Center of Strategic and Development in Washington. And for those who don't know the Center of Strategic and Development in Washington, the Center of Washington is the fourth year on the Tawali, which is the first year on the Tawali, which is the first year on the على صعيد العالم في مجال الدراسات الأمنية وبذلك هو واحد من أهم المراكز في العالم إن لم يكن أهمها في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أنتوني كورزمان واحد من الباحثين اللي يمتلك تفاصيل كاملة عن المشهد في الشرق الأوسط وفي العراق وهو قد عمل في المنطقة لسنين طويلة من خلال واشتغل مستشار في الخارجية وفي الدفاع ولديه الكثير الكثير من الكتابات والبحوث اللي تقرأ من قبل متخذي القرار مؤخرا أنتوني كتب تقرير وسوى له تحديث ثلاث مرات لهذا التقرير عن الحوار الاستراتيجي واليوم أنا راح أسأل على هذا الأساس عن هذا التقرير اللي وصف بالعراق أنه دولة بها أو نصح بها الإدارة الأمريكية أن تهتم في حوارها الاستراتيجي مع العراق بثلاث أشباح كما يسميها في الدولة العراقية اللي هي كأنما يريد أن يقول ماكو وجود لهذه الدولة هذه الأشباح هي التي تسيطر في المجال السياسي والاقتصادي والأمني ورح أسأله ونشوف ماذا يقول توني uh, uh, thank you again uh, you have been so kind to, to be with us for the second time uh, this is a real honor and privilege for us uh, I will start with you with a question about your recent report, which is widely circulated among Iraqis uh, and among intellectual Iraqis. Uh, in, that, in that report, uh, you mentioned uh, three ghosts uh, and with, uh, with two or three, four, five uh, uh, underlines uh, uh, under the ghost. Uh, of these, of these three uh, Iraqi, of these three Iraqi ghosts, uh, uh, what do you consider uh, is the most important or uh, ghost which has to be dealt with by the United States? Uh, especially in the Iraqi dialogue. Which one you think is the most important priority to start with it? Of course, uh, uh, you can uh, first uh, go through these three ghosts uh, and uh, describe it uh, briefly. I think that when we talk about ghosts, I sh perhaps should explain my first trip to Iraq was in 1972. And I was in Iraq very often during the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, I was there again in 1991 and after 2003. So when I talk about ghosts, I'm talking about a country that has been in crisis since my first visit. And when we talk about economics, many of the problems that 
exist today go back to some of the causes that led to the fall of the monarchy. When we talk about the security services, what went on even during the Iran-Iraq War, you could see the tensions, divisions, the fact that there were, back in those days, Shiite minority groups in the Marsh area. And when it comes down to governance, there seem to be two options. One is you have a stable authoritarian structure that basically profits for itself, or you have an unstable structure that eventually makes things worse and creates more divisions. So let me go back to Steve's first point. Before you turn to the US, you really need to look at Iraq today and its history and say that the primary problem is for Iraq to fix Iraq. Now, having said that, we had a brief this morning from two of the people who are shaping the dialogue that will be held on the 11th. They pointed out that this will not be at the ministerial level. It will be electronic, a little like our meeting today. It will be a deputy secretary for policy, David Hale, who will be conducting it. But I guess the good news is you can't have briefing books electronically, at least as yet. So in that sense, there'll be some limits to what can be discussed. But there were some other aspects of that brief that were, I think, reassuring. First, nobody made any grandiose promises or called for dramatic changes. What they were talking about was trying to build or help build within the severe limitations we face a stable, sovereign Iraq, which can stand on its own. They were not talking about some kind of strategic partnership where the US dictates policy or shapes Iraq as an ally in dealing with Iran. They were talking not simply about some policy issues which are critical to the United States, and let me make them clear. One is that we have to be able to deal, at least under this administration, with the relationship where Iraq responds to the sanctions. We have to see that Iraq is making plans and will use the money wisely. One of the phrases that was used, and you don't hear it often in policy discussions, was we won't throw good money after bad. And there was a great deal of sensitivity to this in international terms, the IMF, the World Bank, not simply US policy. There was a statement that we would be there in security to support Iraq achieve security in the sense against ISIS and in dealing with offensive forces. Uh, I can't hear you, Munquith. I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I just want you to please put some more highlight on the first point you mentioned about the money, the bad money, Andy. So can you explain this? I think there has been too much investment in aid and in projects, which has been consumed and wasted, partly by constant changes in government, partly by factional divisions, within Iraq, and to be blunt, in terms of corruption. Okay. And these are comments that don't simply come from the United States. There has to be a process, particularly given the corona crisis, the oil crisis, our other obligations, where this money will be used 
with some integrity. More than that, it is not simply the US, but it is your Gulf neighbors that also talk about the fact, why contribute? Why provide aid when the money is wasted or taken? So the quality of governance is a critical issue. And as I say in my report, it's not an American view. It's an international view that Iraq's levels of corruption are simply unsustainable. In terms of security, there will be as a key criteria that if we are to go on with a security relationship, it is Iraq that is going to have to protect the Americans who provide security support. That the US is not going to create a basing structure or a military structure that will basically substitute for an Iraqi government and Iraqi security forces that at least control that aspect of the PMFs and other threat. There has to be real progress in Iraq towards energy independence, not quick, not sudden, but the waivers under the sanctions are not going to go on forever, but more than that, the amount of waste that is coming out of Iraq, just in terms of importing gas and electricity. Again, one click, I'm losing you. Can you hear me? All right. So these are critical issues that deal with things that need to be negotiated now. I think that people talked about the fact that there has to be some approach through the World Bank and the IMF that will focus on longer term development. It is the perception that if there is not a fundamental change in the economy that helps the Iraqi people, we are going to see demonstrations we're going to see this government go the way of the last government. And that requires that there be Iraqi support. So these are areas where I think the US priorities are much less grandiose. Nobody is talking about transforming Iraq. What we are talking about is how do you help a country become a strong, sovereign nation and how can you do that if the country can't help itself okay so where do you where do you think that the the main issue is there i mean uh, the most difficult from your point of view the most difficult area to deal with it is it in the governance or in the security or in economy right now taking current circumstances all right to get through the next period between now and the election we have to have an agreement that will allow u.s forces to stay that will be up to iraq to define the role because it isn't going to be some kind of major deployment it's to help with ISIS, with extremism, and to develop Iraqi forces. But that isn't the basis for a strategic dialogue. Iraq is at a level of economic crisis right now, where within months, it's going to have to seek major outside aid. And to do that, there have to be the conditions where the US can convince the Congress, the administration, and the people, in spite of our problems, that there is an aid program to really help. Now that's both the economy and governance. It is also politics. We have to have politics where we can help a country, not a faction. So this cannot be something that helps 
Shiites or Sunnis or Kurds. So in, there isn't one answer to your question, Monquid. Mm -hmm. And there isn't for you. The basic fact is that the problems you face are becoming so serious that this time you're going to have to address them, or I think the briefing is right. If I were an Iraqi, I would not give you six months to begin to govern and develop policies that offer some hope and some progress. And remember that we will be to some extent caught up on security in the near term. But by the time we hold our election, we will be drafting next year's budget that will cover every aspect of foreign aid to every country in a world where Iraq is only one crisis out of hundreds. Yes. And that is a reality Iraqis really have to face. Mm -hmm. So for for Mr. Academy, if you are in his shoes, what would you start with again? I think again, you need to have an Iraqi position that makes it possible for US security forces to stay, for the US to have an embassy team. But more than that, you have to have the ability to protect international aid efforts, and you have to have a clear structure that justifies that aid. And you should be focusing not just on the US for aid, but in spite of all our problems, your Gulf neighbors and other states. So on the one hand, you need to have an immediate solution to the problem of the PMFs and security. You need to keep complying with the sanctions, and here are the agreements so far, Iraq is complying. But above all, you have to show that there is an Iraq that is moving toward a level where it can actually use aid effectively and serve its people. Not all at once, but there has to be a beginning. All right. Thank you. I will uh, uh, ask you and Steve the same question, which is, if the Iraqi government, motivated by the internal dynamics, political dynamics, uh, insisted on getting all U.S. forces out of Iraq. What would you think be Trump administration position toward that or reaction toward that? Would it would it draw? Well, we already have made major withdrawals. Yeah, but you still you have closed bases. Yeah, you still you have don't have the ability, Munquith to sort of go and intervene. If you get a clear set of demands to leave, given the current basing structure, the infrastructure, the fact you have to resupply and provide logistic routes, you may not do it overnight, you can't. There are too many pieces of equipment, technical systems, it's not people anymore. There aren't that many. But I think you would find that you would be down to the point where you unfortunately got what you asked for. And I say unfortunately because I think you would do yourself a great deal of harm. Why? This is the, the, the one million question. If I could just get in on it one second. Oh, actually, Tony, I think the question was directly to you. So I'll, yeah, I'll let I, you... I, will, I will ask you the same question. This is. You, you will be asked so the same let, question let, later on. One yes, Tony. Tony. Yeah, Tony. Yes, yeah. You don't have a future as a nation if you can't deal 
with your sectarian and ethnic differences more effectively than you are now. You do not have the ability to limit Iranian presence to the degree that you really need to at this point. And if we leave exactly who is going to provide aid and support, what do you think your Gulf neighbors are going to do? What do you think Europe is going to do? And if you have seen any serious foreign aid recently from Russia or China, I would dearly love to know exactly what country it went to. Okay. I think too, how are you going to live with your own people? Because let me remind you who it is that actually finances the IMF and the World Bank. Yeah, yeah. Okay, clear, clear, crystal clear. Uh, uh, Tony, there, there are on the Q&A some questions for you. And of course, there are some questions for Steve. You can take a look on it and answer it later on. I will uh, turn to uh, Steve. Uh, same question, Steve, please. I have a, I have a somewhat different answer than, than Tony on this one. First, to your immediate question, what would happen? What would the Trump administration do? I think the Trump administration would happily draw down uh, American forces out of Iraq. And I don't think that you would get a tremendous, you might get arguments from specific members of Congress, but there would be no uproar over this. Keep in mind that the United States has now elected two presidents in a row. And of course we don't elect presidents on foreign policy issues, but both of whom made it very clear that they felt that the American investment in the Middle East, and when they said the Middle East, I think they really meant Iraq, was not worth it. So you're not going to get an argument from the American people. You're hardly get an argument from members of Congress. I think the, uh, the military, uh, again, Tony Proud is much better positioned to answer this, but I think the military is tired of the Middle East. I think the, the counterterrorism mission is one that remains critically important to Americans. Um, but of course, people could say that we can conduct counterterrorism operations without being in Iraq. We've done that in a variety of places. Um, we can continue to support Iraq in its counterterrorism missions by not physically being there in the way that we have been before. I think ultimately, though, ultimately, um, we probably will stay at a much reduced number in order to advise. But really what we're talking about, Bunkit, is something that I was getting at in my response to your earlier questions, is that ultimately this is a political problem that Iraqis need to resolve. Um, uh, a, a extremism, there is a, obviously an ideological component to extremism. And a lot of governments in the Middle East want to emphasize the ideological component of extremism because that absolves them. That means they don't have to take responsibility for the political problems that contribute to this phenomenon as well. Dealing with those political problems would go a long way to shrink the base of people who find these messages from extremists appealing and subsequently make it easier for Iraq to deal with them, albeit with American help. But I agree in the end with Tony's, with Tony's recommendation. Don't ask unless you're fully prepared to deal with the consequences of it. Okay. President Trump has tried to leave the Middle East a couple of times. He now has set the table where if he decides, if that issue comes around to him again, and he decides for whatever reason that he wants to leave, there's no one that I can see in his cabinet who will put the brakes on that. Even the State Department? The, the State Department is, I'm trying to think, <laughs> Tony, I'm no, trying to think diplomatically. This is, this, it, it's not just a function of the Trump administration. There's a tendency with American presidents to centralize power in the White House. And the State Department can write eloquent memos about certain things. Uh, Secretary Pompeo is not 
the State Department's uh, representative to the president. He is the president's representative to the State Department. So as, as much as he has a lot of influence in the, uh, in, with the president, um, it, it, it furiously written memos from the Near East Bureau and the State Department policy planning staff and others about the need to remain in Iraq uh, will no doubt be well written and interesting, but may not have the kind of political effect, uh, the political and diplomatic effect that, uh, well, that, that those who want to stay in Iraq would, would, would like. Okay, so uh, now you have some questions, uh, Steve. Uh, yeah, I went through some of them. Yeah. And responded. So I'm looking through some the, more the right Arab, now. The, the Arabic one, we will translate the Arabic one. Rand will, will ask it or, or me, but uh, for the English. Yes. I. Um, yeah, it would take me too long with my Hans Baer dictionary to translate those questions in, <laughs> in Arabic. Uh, I, see a, I see a bunch for Tony, um, but I'll... I'll take the one from uh, Amir Jafar about how serious is the United States for the success of the strategic dialogue. But I think, I think the Trump administration's more limited goals with regard to Iraq is a positive way to approach it. I think that they are as serious as far as it goes. But I think, as Tony pointed out, this is the initial round on June 11th is not at a ministerial level. Uh, Mr. Hale is a well-respected diplomat, but at the same time, it doesn't seem as of yet that we are getting the kind of way in which the U.S. government can get fully vested in an, in, in an issue. We don't see that in Iraq, and I think we're unlikely to see it in Iraq. The limited goals, Iraq, able to stand on its own and sovereign. We're serious about that. Beyond that, we're not serious. And if we don't get there, it's it's okay. it's not a breaker. It's not a it's not a as we say in the United States, make or break issue. Uh, I I would like you, uh, Steve, to answer Ambassador Ali Dabar' uh, uh, question, which is, you can see it. Uh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The especially the. The part which he said that the that United States has lost the, the the fight over Iraq or the struggle with Iran. Iran had won the strength. This is why I uh, want you to to uh, answer this question. Uh, also, Tony may uh, comment on that because this is one of the main topics. Usually, intellectual Iraqis talk about it. Who won the fight over Iraq? As Iraq is uh, a battle uh, field. Tony, yeah. you want to start out? Who won Iraq? I don't think anybody at this point has clearly won anything. I don't know whether it is the loser that backs the winner in Syria, for example, or the winner. Being tied to the Assad regime means you're tied to Assad. But in Iraq, I think the divisions are unfortunately deep within Iraq. You have pro-Iranian militia elements and factions. You have much less powerful Sunni factions. You have a separate Kurdish regional government. You have a deeply divided central government when it comes down to the regular military forces, I think that those are much more still under U.S. and allied influence than they are under Iranian influence. But at the end of it, what have you won? And I think one difficulty people have here and have throughout this region is it is so easy to play a spoiler role to make the divisions worse, to create more problems, to delay or prevent solutions than it is to get any meaningful form of control that the ability to be a spoiler is confused with winning. 
you have an Iranian government which is experiencing about as many popular problems as the Iraqi government was last fall. You have a region filled with countries facing a major set of economic crises. The two of them that are at this point worse off as major states are both Iraq and Iran. And Iran's wounds are almost as much self-inflicted as the result of sanctions. So can you have clashes in the Gulf? Can you create a situation where the United States that has no status of forces agreement with Iraq pulls out of bases if Iraq does not respond? The answer is yes, and then what? Where will Iraq be in a year under its current economic and governance structure? Where will its security forces be? And here I would disagree with Steve because frankly, you had one of the most effective armies and air forces in the region till 2003, even after 1991. You're at least four to five years away from having that kind of capability in any organized sense. If it hadn't been literally for tens of thousands of American air sorties, you basically could not possibly have defeated ISIS. Your Air Force lacks all of the ISNR capabilities, intelligence, the other assets necessary to deal with an advanced counterterrorism campaign, much less any of your neighbors. And your neighbors are, let's see, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. Well, Jordan. So you have one potential neighbor on your border. These are realities that you are going to have to come to grips with. All right. I, I think there is a, a question in Arabic also for Tony. But Steve, uh, if you want to comment on that uh, also. Yeah, and uh, Ali al Dabal's question. I, yeah, there I'm is also at... another question in the same, Dr. Basman asked the same question, almost the same question, about the mistake that the uh, United States made in uh, delivering Iraq on a golden plate I to saw Iran. That. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think, uh, uh, obviously, it was not the intention of uh, the Bush administration. Of course, there were plenty of people who warned uh, the Bush administration uh, that this was a, a, potential, a potential outcome. What I would say, especially since I'm, I, I was struck by a line in what Ali al Dabao's question um, here about Iran and winning, and it strikes me, Iran, Tony's right, no one's really won, but Iran has, in the words of Ali al has won the struggle in Iraq compared to the United States. Okay. And this is something that I'm trying to, to get at. Maybe you can't declare the Iranians a winner, but in terms of the ability, the willingness, the resources, uh, and the stakes involved, the Iranians are more deeply committed to Iraq, whether it's malevolent or not, uh, than is the United States, um, which is quite far away uh, and easily distracted by other, uh, by other issues. This is uh, unfortunate, um, but I think that this is, this is the state uh, of things uh, as they are. I would like to be able to say that in the United States, we recognize that this was an error. I think we do. I'd like to say um, we have the political will, the financial resources, and the military wherewithal, which we do, but not combined with anybody who wants to do it, to invest in Iraq in a way that will encourage those twin goals that the Trump administration has, a sovereign Iraq that can stand on its own. My sense is that we don't have any of those things 
that we are willing to use uh, in order to make that happen. And that's why it was so striking to me to see that billboard a rock for the Iraqis. And again, you know, back, I think Tony has said it in a number of different ways, and I've said it in a number of different ways. Basically, the United States is changing and has been changing its approach to Iraq, and that ultimately it's going to be up to Iraqis to make sure that it is a sovereign country that can stand on its own. And that starts with, to my mind, the perverse political institutions of the state that create and replicate these problems uh, over time. Otherwise, there are lots of other problems around the world that the United States can be, uh, can be involved in. And it, it, I think that we've demonstrated the limits of what we can do in a constructive way. And we've also demonstrated how destructive we can be. And I don't want that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony, there is a question in, in Arabic for you. You mentioned about the sanctions and would Iraq uh, be able, or the Iraqi government be, be able to commit to these sanctions. So here is the question. Uh, two days ago, the minister of uh, power and uh, of electricity and uh, oil and I think in Iran visited Iraq and he signed an agreement. This is the news. I'm this. I'm, I'm not sure about it, but this is a question. Uh, he signed an agreement with the Iraqi government to provide uh, liquid gas and electricity to Iraq for the next two years which is clearly against the sanction. So what would you think be the consequences of that on this well, first, dialogue? First, the problem here is not that we are enforcing the sanctions now. We are granting a waiver. The waiver is normally for a year. I haven't seen the agreement either, and I don't know what the contents are. But I think that the goal we have pushed for is one many Iraqis have pushed for, which is energy independence. It is ridiculous that you are importing gas from Iran at $7.50 a unit and doing it when you have power plants that are within a short pipeline worth of supplying those plants and basically you're flaring the gas nearby. Do, do you the idea the, of looking Tony, Tony, at... Do you know the, the international price of, of the gas? You, you mentioned 7.5, they sell it for Iraq. What is the, the market price? Do you, do you have any idea about that? No, there is no market price because it varies so much dependent on the pipeline and the source. Looking at uh, the estimates from the U.S. and they were quoted by the State Department this morning, it was 750 versus 150. 150? Remember, you're flaring the gas. Yeah, I know. All right. When you're throwing it away, it isn't very expensive to move it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so what do you think? Uh, what uh, uh, the the consequences of if this agreement really signed between Iraq and Iran? Again, since we haven't seen the agreement. I don't know what the waiver provisions are. I don't believe the State Department has seen it in depth yet. Uh, let me say that on occasion, people actually offer to pay me money to predict oil prices. And I can't tell you how difficult it is for me to not take it <laughs> because anybody that stupid deserves to lose the money. If we haven't seen the agreement, how do we evaluate it? 
Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, th there is a question for you, the Mr. Kordsman. I mean, it's it's written the misspelled your name. Do you think that one of the reason for the emergency of Iraqi ghost was the non-creative Paul uh, uh, Bremer chaos of Paul Bremer uh, Bremer administration after the announcement of the occupation of Iraq? I certainly think that in the first six months of Jerry Bremer, the U.S. had put people into the country who had no background at all in development. It had not prepared, in spite of warnings from quite a number of people, both in uh, the Gulf and in the U.S., for what would happen after the invasion. But the fact was, that instead of the U.S. trying to do something really ambitious and changing everything, basically speaking, the system went on without the central direction and management. People talk about the actual level of U.S. aid. There really wasn't much U.S. economic aid. Certainly, if you're paying off a student loan, it looks like a lot of money. When it comes down to development funding, there actually was surprisingly little activity and basically the aid spending rose seriously only after the fighting started. So you really can't blame Mr. Bremer for that. You certainly can say that the aid efforts were not particularly well planned. I sat through a number of the joint planning exercises and it was very clear sometimes that neither side, because there were Iraqis directly involved. I think today, let me note that since 2011, there's been very, very little actual non-humanitarian civil aid, almost no effort at development that wasn't a direct support of an Iraqi program. And I think also one point I would make, Steve, is people haven't really looked at the current budget request for the U.S. forces. You're talking now something well under $40 billion. That's not cheap, but in this type of effort, it also isn't particularly expensive. Uh, the costs are going way down because you're pulling assets out that you don't need there because you're not doing that fighting anymore in the same way. You're down to only about a third of the bases. They're much smaller. You're down to one brigade of security force assistance units plus another reasonable number of troops, but this is the kind so of how effort much, how much do you estimate, support. Tony, I think you have the number. Uh, how much do you estimate the cost of the U.S. military existence in Iraq right now, roughly? Again, I just gave it to you. If you look at the, the program cost was around $40 billion a year. It was, yes. The actual spending is probably now closer to around 20 to 25 billion. Yes. Wow. So as as someone that who is paying off a yeah. As that, someone who is paying off a student loan, 40 billion actually sounds like a lot of money to me. Um, yeah. but I recognize I recognize Tony's point. I, I, two things. First, uh, just specifically to the question about you know, the non-creative chaos of Paul Bremer's administration. Um, certainly, Ambassador Bremer had his faults and made his mistakes, but I think that we need to remember, going back to 2002, that the view of the Bush administration was, and this, I think, underscores Tony's point about the limited amount of development aid and assistance the United States has given. It was the view of the Bush administration that, uh, the United States would invade Iraq, overthrow Saddam Hussein and the regime, and that Iraq is a wealthy country with talented people and a sophisticated infrastructure, and it would be able to rebuild itself. 
And when that became clear that that wasn't necessarily going to go according to plan, uh, there was still no real commitment to do the kinds of things that the United States could do. We were trapped by the initial concept of how Iraq would go and never actually really adjusted to it. Now, again, as far as I, I don't dispute the fact that $40 billion in the grand scheme of things of what the Defense Department spends on things is not is, is, is a it's a significant sum, but it's not a huge sum of money. The question that I have is, is that money being well spent in the overall broader context of what's happening in Iraqi politics? So is the idea that we will be in Iraq in perpetuity spending $40 billion a year waiting for the Iraqis to get their act together? Or is there, a, or, or, or is there you know, some sense that the Iraqis need to get their acts together in order for the United States to spend $40 billion in the, I think the two things need to go in a, in a different sequence than that they have been going. Well, I think you're right, Steve. The one thing I would say in defense of the official position is they made it very clear that this was a potentially critical strategic relationship. But Iraq had to meet certain conditions. We would not stay if it didn't. And I think it is also, again, clear that if Iraq does meet those conditions, the U.S. would be there providing assistance and a security guarantee at lower cost and probably with more real world effect. Part of the problem now is that if you have to cope with both the militias and the Iraqi security forces in the middle of a massive economic crisis, you're not only taking on ISIS you're in a defensive mode, which we have said as part of this sort of strategic dialogue, we will not continue. That Iraq is going to have to provide security for the U.S. forces that stay, and it has to have a relationship where they can defend themselves. That if it doesn't provide that aid, so these conditions have been laid out pretty clearly already. My, my view is, has been shaped essentially by Assistant Secretary Schenker in a con long conversation with him about this. That I, I, the, the, the administration's position on this specific issue is something that I can get behind. My concern is that, again, the political institutions of the state uh, create these perverse outcomes and that it sucks us in, in for a very long time without us getting anywhere. So I think that they're onto something. I just wonder, and this is not a statement about Iraqis, this is a statement about Iraq's institutions and how they reflect the current social order. I wonder if they can do, uh, if they can do those things that would move Iraq forward. I have my doubts. Okay. Uh, now I think we have 10 more minutes or 11 minutes, uh, 12 minutes. So uh, I will give six minutes for, for uh, every speaker to choose uh, whatever question or couple of questions uh, he has in front of him to answer it. So, uh, Tony? Well, I don't see I have questions to all panelists. Uh, none of them seem to focus beyond what you uh, have said, because I don't see anything addressed to me on this list of the questions in the chat list. Yeah, okay. It's not on the chat list. It's in the Q&A. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. So th there is a, a couple of questions. There are a couple of questions about the uh, position of United States towards the MNF and the militias. I think it is basic that these kinds of forces 
are going to become factional, that they take on, the longer they exist, the more political they become, the more divisive they become. It's not a matter simply of Iran and pro-Iranian militias. You don't want pro-Sunni militias. You want to bring, to the extent you can, the Peshmerga into an integrated structure. You cannot have a modern state that has independent military factions tied to part of its political structure, which is already divided against itself and not have them pose a security threat. And it doesn't matter whether they're pro-Iranian or not in that sense. Okay. And there are also there is another question it's repeated quite often is whether in in this or in other dialogue about the ethical and legal responsibility of united states to reform what happened in iraq due to the invasion and i I, I always face this question, try to answer it, but you know, this question keeps popping up every time we have a discussion with uh, US experts. So what do you think, Anthony? Well, let me give you two answers. First, there is no provision in international law that requires you to pay reparations <laughs> or to deal with this you had a government which may not have been proliferating but was posturing as if it was. You also have no practical chance that you're going to get the reparations. And more than that, if you got them, you haven't demonstrated you would do anything useful with them. Yeah. So I think it is probably a good idea to focus on the things you can get if you want to have a coffee house argument, have a coffee house argument. But uh, it is not going to make your life better. I know, I know. Let me let me just answer it. I I agree with Tony. You know, this is a it's a coffee house argument. I will say that um, my my overall sense is that we're never going to get to. There are many Iraqis who believe that the United States, of course, has a ethical responsibility to stick. Uh, with Iraq. The problem is that uh, many Americans would like to have had Iraq turn out differently than it has, but now have since moved on. That's an unfortunate fact of reality. I think one of the more ethical things that we can do, though, is we can, and I will, you know, leave it where I began, uh, Iraq for the Iraqis. That's the way it should have been, and that's the way it should be in the, in the, in the future. And my, 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 the whole kind of thrust of the arguments that I'm making have been a little bit of tough love for Iraqis uh, say, hey, you cannot rely on the United States forever because we haven't proven ourselves to be entirely reliable here and we haven't been able to grasp your country for as long as we've been there. And if you do want help from the United States in discrete areas, clean it up, clean up that political mess and then we can have a more effective and constructive relationship. But ultimately, it's going to have to be Iraq for the Iraqis. Okay. If I may uh, Steve, uh, just sorry. ask a short yeah. question. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask it to your audience? Yes. Can you name a single country in the developing world that has been developed up from the outside since 1945? Every country I know that has moved toward development, has basically developed itself, found its own development path, and sought aid for something that can work. Yeah. And Absolutely. almost all of them began with an easier situation than Iraq. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to uh, turn to uh, another question, which I see it important before giving the stage to uh, Steve. Uh, uh, 
about this strategic dialogue, do you think that the current U.S. administration narrative to this dialogue uh, is that it looks to Iraq in Iranian uh, eyes, I mean, as a country which can help in its politics toward Iran, or it looks to Iraq in this strategic dialogue as an ally. What do you think, both of you? I, my, Steve, go ahead. Sure, I think uh, the United States sees Iraq in a broader con challenge or conflict with the Iranians. Um, I think that the, in general, uh, the, there is a sense that what we've done in Iraq can't be repaired, but at least Iraq can be, our influence in Iraq can be leveraged in a way to achieve certain goals with regard to Iran. Um, and that's certainly part of the things that I support, sovereign Iraq that can stand on its own. Um, the kind of political physics of the Gulf were that Iraq and Iran counterbalanced each other. We undermined Iraq and it wasn't, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody, although it was that Iran would try to play this game and dominate Iraq, especially after the Iran-Iraq war. So now I think the United States is seeking to leverage Iraq and that influence, as I said, in this, in, in meeting the Iranian challenge. Um, as I said before, I think that the Iranians, it is a much higher stakes game for the Iranians. And I think they have greater staying power, if only because of geography and because of their, their history. Keep in mind, we are five months away from a presidential election and that maximum pressure thing can go away almost immediately. Um, and how the, an incoming team would view Iraq uh, is going to be, it might be very different, but at least for the moment, at least for the moment, it is through the prism of America's uh, confrontation, for lack of a better term, with the Iranians. Okay. I think, yes, Tony, if I may respond, the viewpoint that, and here I have to say, that the United States does not speak with one voice. There are hawks that are very strongly anti-Iran. There are people who are focused on counterterrorism and ISIS. But in listening to the briefing on the dialogue to come, people kept mentioning stability and sovereignty and basically the best way of containing Iran was to have a strong sovereign Iraq. That is not an Iraq that has US forces. It isn't an Iraq that has the massive military machine that existed under Saddam Hussein. It is essentially an Iraq which can stand on its own. Now does that support the US strategic position in the way Steve just outlined? Yes. But what I don't see is any effort at this point to create any kind of Iraqi security structure that would pose a threat to Iran. It might be a more effective deterrent. It might protect the ability to avoid having independent popular militia forces, and it might help with border security, but that's not something that is going to help the US in a military confrontation with Iran. Okay. Uh, I think we have consumed all the time available for us. Uh, uh, I want to, to thank you very much for your participation and hopefully we can have some other meetings. Uh, I will turn to Arabic to uh, as a final uh, uh, 
a comment. Um, let me go to the Portuguese. Okay. Uh, الأخوة المستمعين يعني وصلنا إلى نهاية الحلقة هذه أو الندوة وإذا كان شيء أريد أن ألخص من كل ما قيل فإن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية في حوارها الاستراتيجي مع العراق تريد عراق مستقل تريد عراق قوي تريد عراق غير تابع لدولة ليس مو على مود العراق بالمناسبة يعني حتى تكون بس لأنه هذا مثل ما ذكرنا بالآخر شيء بالنهاية يعتقدون أنه التوازن الاستراتيجي في الخليج بين العراق وإيران مهم ولذلك لازم يكون عندنا دولة عراقية قوية ولكن لا نتوقع علينا أن لا نتوقع أن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ستساعد دولة مثل العراق أو أي دولة في العالم ما لم تساعد تلك الدولة نفسها هذه كانت الـ 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 الاستنتاج الرئيسي ساعدوا نفسكم حتى العالم تساعدكم وأنا أيضا أقول لكل العراقيين لا تتوقعوا من أحد يساعدنا إذا ما إحنا ساعدنا نفسنا لأنه حتى إذا كانوا يريدون يساعدونا مثل ما قالوا شلون راح يضمن أنه الفلوس اللي تجي للعراق وكل شيء يجي للعراق راح يبقى بالعراق وما راح ينباق وراح يتم التصرف به بالطريقة الصحيحة شكرا جزيلا لكم ولحضوركم وآسفين على الإشكال اللي صار في البداية وإن شاء الله راح تكون عندنا لقاء قريب إذا مو الجمعة القادمة يجوز حتى قبله يكون عندنا لقاء آخر شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا أشوفك إن شاء الله شكرا طيب.